Welcome everyone to our June workshop. Uh, there's a couple of extra faces, which is good. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, David Kennedy, who is sorry, I'm not going to I'm not going to know your title, but David is up in AFL Sunraysia now. Welcome along, David. Do, can you just give a quick little spiel about your role up in up there in Mildura? Yes, so I've been um, in this um, participation coordinator in Mildura. Um, so I've been in the role for a couple of months now. And uh, this is my first umpiring workshop. Welcome. Hopefully it's uh, something that can enlighten you, something a bit different. Yeah, cool. Uh, and we've also got, I can see, Al Dow, who is from FIDA. Uh, so FIDA, for those who don't know, is, um, I'm probably going to get this wrong. Um, uh, I'm not even going to have a tent. It's disabled, <laughs> disabled, uh, the Disabled <laughs> League. It yep, is go, so no, you go, go, Al, you explain okay. what FIDA is and uh, your, your role. Sure. Um, so I'm Al, I'm the CEO of FIDA, uh, previously FGM with AFL Vic. Uh, first time for session. Um, so FIDA is a statewide league for people with an intellectual, predominantly with an intellectual disability. Um, so we have almost 900 participants statewide. Um, so our, I guess in terms of umpiring, we use existing community umpires because uh, our competition's on a Sunday. Um, so a lot of them will do seniors on a Saturday and feeder on a Sunday. Awesome. Thanks for uh, taking along. It's OK. And let's get this started. Uh, before we get started any further, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are gathered on today, a land on which we play our great game of Australian football. I acknowledge our Acknowledge elders both past, present and emerging and pay our respects to the Aboriginal connection to land, sea and spirit. And as always, I've got a new bit of artwork, so I'd like to acknowledge Billy J. O'Toole, who is a proud Wadawarung man, which I believe is the Geelong Barwon area uh, for this piece of artwork, which symbolises the Wadawarung country and connection. So the agenda for today uh, centered around the confirmed one uh, yesterday. So we'll um, get straight into our with the female mentorship program. Uh, we've got Ricky who's joined us about coaching. We'll go through academy updates, improvement plan, the accreditation update, fan, which is I think most people have been looking forward to, um, the junior club engagement, um, and then the Victorian umpire requirements. And uh, Charles, um, I don't see she's online. I'm pretty sure she's an apology today, so we won't have her workshop. Uh, for this month. Uh, and I'm going to hand straight over to Al to have a quick chat. Thanks, Andrew, and um, thanks to everyone for coming along today. And um, I guess hope everyone's going OK, depending on where you are in Victoria. Um, I am in Melbourne, so I am going to school in a little bit, but that will be remote teaching. Um, and I'm very happy to say that that will be finishing in a couple of days, which will be great. I just wanted to give you a quick update on a couple of the programs. Um, obviously, we've got our female mentorship program, which continues to run in an online forum um, across the season. And we've been really fortunate. We've had a couple of fantastic uh, guests so far. So I think I've, I've touched base with you already this season. We had um, Dr. Samantha May come and speak with us um, about, I guess, female health. And then more recently, we had Nicole Livingston, who is the head of uh, women's football at the AFL and has uh, been an Olympic swimmer and, um, I guess, media presenter and been involved in lots of different, I guess, a variety of experiences across her journey. And it was just fantastic to hear from her and the girls got a lot out of it and also asked us some really great questions. So we've been really fortunate to have that up and running on our Zoom calls once a month. Um, Libby Tuby and myself uh, facilitate that and we've had a really great turnout. So there's about 30 odd girls in the program in total. And we have about 16, 17 consistently attend those sessions, which is great. And if you do have any girls that I guess are in the talent program, the Talent Academy, um, I guess touch, touch base with them and see if they're attending. And if they're not, um, you know, I'd encourage you to encourage them to attend because the girls that do come along, it's a great network. Um, and hopefully we get a few things out of the different um, guest speakers that we have. And talking about that, we've got our next couple booked in. We've got Rob Jackson, who, as we know, is the AFL uh, fitness coach. He'll be touching base with us about the different requirements and how they've changed and just giving the girls some different general tips about what they can do to further increase their fitness. Because, you know, we know, um, I guess that is always a bit of a concern or, or a conversation, particularly um, with girls kind of coming through the ranks. The other person we have now, um, Hopefully locked in for days, Daisy Pierce, and again, another great, uh, I guess, role model for, for young females to look up to, someone who has played the game, um, but also been part of shaping AFLW. Um, also that balance, she balances being a mother now with playing professionally. So 
really some really excellent, I guess, to help, I guess, these girls, these young girls coming up to see, I guess, what different opportunities football and sport can lead to, but also, I guess, hear from these different role models that they've probably seen that um, in the past we haven't had so many female role models. So to actually have to into, I guess, um, guess chat with these people and, and ask them questions and hear from them is um, really exciting. And I'm really excited about, about it as well. The other thing I want to touch base on really quickly is we had our National Female Umpire Coaches Network uh, workshop for the first time, and that involved many uh, female coaches from around Victoria and also nationally. And we, Chelsea, my, Chelsea and myself ran that program and we, I guess, started on the inclusion topic, um, like what we've done in these micro workshops. So we've got to have two sessions this year uh, for the National Female Umpire Coaches Network. And again, it's just really a way for us to start thinking about, well, we do have, uh, I guess, only a very few number of females who are coaches in umpiring. And so it's a way for them to network together, I guess, to just chat with others who are in similar positions to them. And hopefully that encourages more girls to take up that coaching role. So we've had our first workshop and our second will be in uh, July, which is actually our, um, I guess, National Female Coaches Month, which I'm sure um, you'll hear a bit more in due course. But that's a really exciting opportunity for those women to be involved. And again, if you do have females who are coaches in your uh, in, at your umpiring clubs and they haven't been part of this, um, please reach out to them and just check where they have. And if not, um, I'd love to get their emails and invite them along because this is a really great opportunity for us to network, as I said, and also just to see, I guess, what different opportunities and, and networks this can lead to further down the track. So. That's the last update from me. I guess the final part is just um, the school umpire courses. They have been going really well. So thank you to everyone for being really proactive in organising them and um, helping facilitate them through your facilitators. Hit a little bump in the road, obviously, with COVID, but that was probably always expected at some point. So probably most of this term is, is probably put on hold for now, but we'll kind of um, jump back on the next term and see where that takes us. But thanks to all those who have been really accommodating of that happening. And I hope that you have had some really successful results because I have seen um, quite a few students have actually, I guess, elected to continue umpiring from those courses. So it appears that they're being quite successful this year. So I would encourage you to, I guess, keep uh, helping those and assisting those to work because we have seen them, um, I guess, transition quite well into our into our umpiring clubs. So thank you for your support on all three of those programs. And if you do have questions um, along the way at all, please feel free to ask, um, email me or give me a call. But were there any questions on those three, I guess, topics just for now while I am here? No worries. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Again, if you do have questions along the way, Female Mentorship Program, National Female Umpire Coaches Network or the School Umpire Course, um, please shoot me an email because um, with your help, these programs run really successfully. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks very much, Elle. Uh, I'm going to roll straight into handing over to Ricky Coburn. So Ricky is the Coaching Development Education Lead for Victoria. Um, the reason I've asked Ricky to have a quick little chat is um, there are a few incidents flagged to me personally, um, probably a month and a half ago in terms of coaches being reported or officials on benches being reported. Um, and I asked Ricky what the process was from there, um, from his perspective in, in what happens outside of the tribunal. So I've just got Ricky along to just explain what that process is um, after there's been a report by an umpire for a, a coaching official. Just, I guess, just to highlight that there is a process that is going to sort of support what the umpire is doing on match day um, to ensure that there, there's things being done to ensure it doesn't occur repeatedly um, over time. So I'll hand straight over to Rick. Thanks, Andrew. Um, mate, I might just get you to stop sharing your screen for a moment. I want to see all these wonderful people for a moment. I mean, a lot of familiar faces out there, so thanks for your time today. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen in a, in a moment and just with through um, from the coaching side of things, what the process is. Just before we start though, I just want you to um, just take a couple of seconds just to think about um, coaching behaviour. Um, try to get a picture of any sort of coaching behaviour you can remember over the last um, few weeks or, or this year. Just think about what that behaviour was um, and whether it was negative or positive. I just want you to take a few seconds, see if you can actually get a particular um, coaching behaviour that you can actually really vividly remember. Give you a few seconds, see if you can get something. Now, if you've, if you've got something, uh, was it positive, was it negative? Um, who would like to share? Anyone wants to share? 
Come on, Al. Surely you must have something. <laughs> I've got good and bad. Um, I'll go with the bad one that I had uh, when I was actually in as an FTM. Uh, so going out and monitoring coach behaviour, and it was an under 12s coach um, where the um, the kids, his team, the kids were up. They're up by about five goals at uh, quarter time, and they were hitting each other on the back, going "Great job, great job!" And he was like, "I am absolutely disgusted." How dare you kids come in here, hitting, patting each other on the back for that performance. Um, and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I thought, I'll, I'll wait. And then half time, I thought, I'll wait and see what happens here. And same sort of thing. And then um, he wouldn't let the kids go inside. At half time, it was cold. Um, and he made them all sit on the ground while he stood above them and yelled at them and pointed his finger. Um, wow. So... As a result, I guess, of that is having a chat with him and the president, and he had a um, he had a 12-month break from coaching. Good, eh? That's what we want to see. Anyone else got anything uh, good, bad or otherwise? I've got a good one. I've got one, Rick, for you. Yep. Just um, first negative, a coach at the start of the game who actively promoted the uh, communication needs to be in a positive manner, no language, respect the umpires, et cetera, et cetera. Comes to the quarter time break and for 10 seconds, absolutely break, breaks the kid, swears, carries on, and the captain points out to the coach, hang on, you just told us not to do that. <laughs> so that's one, ex one example. Another example I give is positive being a coach who uh, come to the first uh, halftime break was absolutely flogging a team. So selected his all his midfield, his best players, sent them over to the other team who were short anyway, and then challenged his kids to say, "Right, let's step up. How are we going to? How are we going to continue to win our contest? Let's break this down." So, and that was a fantastic game of football, and everyone enjoyed it. Yeah, a couple of really uh, great examples there, some good and some bad. And unfortunately, when we're talking about the point of the activity, I suppose, is when we talk about coach behaviour, more often than not, we're thinking about um, the poor examples, the poor leadership, the poor direction from our coaches that we feel um, at Coach AFL and AFL Vic Coaching that the coach is the most influential person within the club organisation within the team. Um, on good or bad. Um, so what we're trying to do at the moment with our education is to really be leading the way in, in the area of relationships, building, sustaining positive relationships, creating a positive coaching environment, so not aggressive, um, to be one that's where it's psychological safe for for the participants, um, and for one that um, that has a really clear vision of what that they're actually trying to achieve with their development of their of their players or whatever. So how does that affect um, umpires? Well, if we're going to have a quality, safe environment that's not aggressive, well, it should also incorporate um, our attitudes and behaviour towards the umpires. So we're really um, trying to change our behaviour out in club land. There's some good stuff happening. I know that um, I've seen some great stuff um, over the last couple of weekends in some of our country areas and there's some good stuff happening in the metro but unfortunately we know that there's some stuff that we want to um, be a bit better at so i just want to quickly just show you what our process is really quickly um, can you see my screen everyone can't see anyone else unfortunately so yeah yep you got it all right. good yep thank you all good. so basically um, what is our process for supporting um, everyone in their environment to have good coach behaviour. The process very clearly is around um, when we see poor behaviour, there's a citation process in, in place. And what that means is that there's a series of stages that we can go through to um, have a look at, um, at the particular coach's behaviour that's been deemed inappropriate and work through that with the league. Uh, with the club and with the coach. So when the coach first starts um, at the start of the year, part of their mandated coach accreditation for foundation requires them to sign a coach's code of conduct. And it looks like this. 
it goes through 16 different items. Um, and you can see one partic particular interest for this group in number 11 around the respect, foster respect of umpires, opponents, other coaches, administrators and so on. It has 16 different items here that the coach signs, um, signs their name to, signs their, um, their responsibility to maintain. So with the citation policy, if we feel, if the league feels, if umpires feel that the coach is in breach of these uh, code of conduct, there's a few things that we can actually do. So the first stage is that if there's been a deemed breach of inappropriate behaviour, um, this might have been from the league, the club, someone might have complained. It might have been reasonably on the minor side by the people observing have sort of suggested it might have been quite a minor breach. That would sort of come into our first stage of the process. It would be looked into by the AFL staff in conjunction with the league. Um, some recommendations would be made. I'd be notified. There's a coaching database that uh, the AFL staff, the first in stage one would would make a note on the coaching database and I'll just bring it up really quickly for you. This is what it looks like here. You can see where there's citation ones and twos and so on. The breach would be just, just put down. There would be no assumption of, of guilt to start with. It would just be noted that there's been something that needs to be looked into. Um, and then we'd go through the process um, from there. Usually in this stage, there would be a, a warning or a, but perhaps a, an official citation, a written um, citation to the coach, to the club, that would also be placed on their Sports TG um, account. So we might even have that here for you. Could even be um, on their Sports TG account. I'll just might. This is confidential, of course, everyone. <laughs> Sharon, you might get a. You might be interested in this one. There's an example of where there's a coach that's had some documentation put on their sports T TG account where there's been a citation and some other documentation put on. So this is a good way for us to track behaviour. So this is why we are quite interested from the coaching point of view that when there is behaviour that's, that's not appropriate, we want to know about it. We want to be able to track it so that we can follow this process through. If it's a little bit more serious and we get into a stage two breach where it's been serious enough for an umpire to make a report, there's been a match report made, it's been quite a serious breach of the coach's code of conduct, um, it's gone to a tribunal, that's an automatic citation from us. It'll either be a citation one if the coach was, um, wasn't given a suspension of any type, there would be a minimum um, citation one for that particular coach because it's been serious enough to go to, to a tribunal. It's been serious enough for the to be an official process. So that would go onto the coach's file. If there was some sort of suspension, uh, that's where um, in this process it would be a citation two. Now that would indicate that the coach um, has um, been suspended in some way. So. That just gives you a little bit of a snapshot of um, the citation process. Who enforces that? Myself, I'm the overseer of it. Um, the, the regional staff in place in conjunction with the league. Um, so this is sort of a, um, just gives you a bit of an example. But I'd love to hear from um, our group today what sort of um, things are, are happening in the environment? What sort of things do you feel comfortable um, reporting or making a note of? And what sort of things do you think we could be better at supporting from an umpire point of view? Throw it over to you guys. Fire away, anyone? Rick, I was just going to. Hi, Sharon. Of, how are you, Rick? I was going to give everyone a little bit of just a glimpse. We had an issue that Rick helped us with um, that wasn't on the field, was off the field um, with one of our umpires, um, and the coach was sending messages via kids to him at school that weren't very nice. So, um, sorry, there goes my work phone ringing. So, um, 
Yeah, Rick's, we've had a, that's been a really big issue because then, and it wasn't on the field, so it made it very hard for the umpire to be able to do anything because he couldn't report him, but he was copying a fair bit of abuse from the player yeah. that the coach was sending to him at school. And it was a really yeah. hard situation that Rick had to look into. Yeah, and it was a tricky one too. So yeah. the easy ones from, from our point of view, I'm sure they're not easy for you, but the easy ones from our point of view is when there has been, it's been on the field, there's been a report by the umpire because it's easy for us to come in straight away and just give that citation. It's going to be an automatic citation one and maybe a two if there's a suspension. So that they're the easy ones for us to do. The hard ones for us is when it happens away from the field or or there hasn't been a report and then there has to be some sort of investigation. But just because it's hard doesn't mean we want to walk away from that. We're pretty committed to try to support and help with that. So in that particular case that Sharon mentioned, we actually had to issue a notice to respond to the coach. So we didn't have enough information to be able to do anything straight off, um, off the bat. So through issuing a, a notice to respond, the coach had to explain why, in, in this case it was a he, why he wasn't in breach of the coach's code of conduct. He didn't necessarily own his behaviour, but what it does do is it lets the coach know that um, we're watching and we're, we're aware of it and that if anything else comes up, um, we'll be able to enforce something. In this case, we were able to do a citation um, and now we're monitoring the situation. Can't solve everything, but um, we're certainly very interested in supporting the environment. We're really trying to um, focus so much of our attention on the coaching environment at the moment. We think if we can get our coaching environment right, a lot of other things will follow along. So the coaching environment very much flows onto game day and, and the respect um, and how we treat um, everyone in that environment. So we know we've got a lot of work to do. We're not, <laughs> we know there's certainly some stuff happening out there that we don't want to see, um, but we're not going to be able to uh, have any behavioural change unless we start actually addressing some of this stuff. Um, Rick, in my previous life as well, um, if we had any issues around sort of coaching, we always made sure that we let the club president know as well, because whilst it might not be something that they would necessarily receive a citation for, um, either the president or the coaching director, just depending if, you know, they're not wanting that type of culture as well. Yeah. It gave them uh, the opportunity good. to make some changes or have some of those conversations too. It's a good point and it's part of the process, um, Al, that the club has to be informed. So even if there's only an official warning, the warning goes to the club, the league is, is notified if the league hasn't necessarily been directly involved, there needs to be collaboration because 100% what you're saying is dead right. Um, if we're going to have some behavioural change, everyone needs to know about it um, and everyone needs to be part of helping um, helping that change to happen. So definitely uh, the club needs to be involved. If there's a citation, the club needs to get a copy of that letter as well. So there's the league. The league needs to be part of that monitoring. Part of what happens after a an official warning um, or a citation one, and this is at every level, um, is there's a monitoring and there's a mentoring sort of support little mechanism in there. And in warnings and citation ones, that's very much from the club, the club supporting the coach and the club mechanisms. In citations two, where there's been some sort of suspension, that's where someone like myself gets involved. The mentoring is a little bit more on a higher level because um, we're, we're, um, we're seeing that the behaviour has been quite severe. So yeah, thanks for that, Al. That's a good point. Hey, Ricky. Um, okay, Billy. Actually, my uh, sport teacher in primary school. Don't know if you remember. <laughs> I had a got a couple, mate. How do I go, Billy? Yeah, well, I, th I reckon you'd be a great person to enforce the standards for coaching because you were good at giving me a good spray. Uh, <laughs> I well, probably I might have got a citation one myself, Billy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, all good. Just a quick question. Um, Around junior coaches versus senior coaches, um, do you feel that you know uh, junior coaches should be held to a higher standard because they're around children, and of course umpires are typically junior umpires at that level. Um, one thing I found is that obviously abuse can be subjective. A lot of older umpires 
kind of like it's water off a duck's back, but obviously junior umpires can be a little bit more susceptible. What's your views on that? 100%. Yeah, definitely. Uh, how's Dad going, by the way, Billy? Is he all right? Yeah, not, not too bad. Uh, he's still running his gym, so yeah. Um, yeah, definitely, um, for sure. We don't want any aggressive type of behaviour around our junior kids. We want that environment to be player-centred and very positive. So this is probably one of the biggest areas where we've got a, a lot of work to do at the moment, is to try to get that change of behaviour around that it's acceptable to be aggressive and and uh, and in that junior environment. We don't need any aggression in that regard. So we want our kids to be competitive and play good, uh, good hard footy or good strong footy or whatever it happens to be, but we don't need our coaches to be aggressive in that environment. So yeah, definitely. Um, and, and really, we need our senior coaches to lead by example in that regard too. Um, we, we really want our, uh, most, most of our senior clubs in Victoria, we're sort of trying to push down the line to get more and more level two trained, senior coaches and uh, upper end youth coaches. And the push behind that is really around um, the training in level two now uh, focuses so much on the environment and relationship piece around what it is to have quality learning environments um, for our participants. And you can't have a quality learning environment if it's supercharged in an aggressive way. Thanks, Ricky. I'll, um, I'll share the coach's code of conduct, Andrew, and I'll also share that process um, with everyone on the call, um, mate. But yeah, certainly reach out if you want me to come back and have another chat at any stage, or if there's some um, some things happening in your particular group and you just want to have a chat, um, more than happy to help if I can. Awesome. Thanks very much, Rick. And um, yeah, I think just I just wanted Ricky to come to highlight that um, as from an umpiring perspective, we've got we've got the support there behind and I know one group reached out and they weren't feeling very supported from a tribunal perspective and that's something that neither Ricky or, or we can control, but the things that Ricky can control or we can control firstly, the, the match day reporting process. So that obviously makes Ricky's job a lot easier. And then, you know, uh, the follow up on that is is Ricky in his role. So um, yeah, hopefully you've taken a couple of little things and a, a little bit of reassurance away from Rick being involved. So thanks um, for joining in today, Rick. Pleasure. Thanks, Andrew. Good luck, everyone. Okay. Uh, so Community uh, Umpire Talent Academy update. Um, so we've got another online PD session tonight, which is on physical preparation. I've had a lot of those umpires involved asking about fitness stuff. Uh, leading into next year. So we've got Adam Valley, who is the State League High Performance Manager uh, presenting, and we'll also once again have three AFL umpires, one from each discipline, um, share their own experiences and advice uh, with their own discipline groups as well. So that starts at 7.30 for those umpires uh, and their, their, their coaches or, or academy managers. Um, this is something that the talent coordinators and myself and Ando have spoken about and and sort of moving forward with, um, and I've I know this diagram has been presented to, I think five five of the academies so far. I'm not sure if all of them have been presented this or they hopefully have been presented the information in some way. But this is just a bit of a cycle of the academy year. So we're currently uh, now in the June to August uh, phase down the bottom on the left, um, where we're just before our lockdown we were starting to organize in-season observations of of community umpires in community senior football so i know in the pre-season we were looking at umpires who were doing nab girls and nab boys practice games so a completely different standard of football to what senior community football is so now we're going to be looking at uh, getting some observations done at senior community level and what that will lead to is the V-Line Cup Carnival in September. Now this week we started to send out invites, not to the entire umpiring panel. Uh, we're just gonna filter it down in, in small little groups, but those invitations have started to be sent out. So the V-Line Cup is uh, in, in September from the 20th to the 23rd uh, of September, which is grand final, AFL grand final week. So the initial invite is for umpires to pick and choose whether they are able to join for the entire week or whether they can only attend 
uh, for one or two days based on their work commitments, study commitments, personal commitments, so whatever whatever they need to work around to see what the, how their involvement can be. <clears throat> what we've also done over the last couple of weeks is start to lock in the coaches that are going to attend. So we've got all the state league development coaches attending the week, so they'll be in attendance to watch the umpires uh, at the carnival. We'll also have um, a couple of different academy match day coaches, so the senior VFL umpires who have been doing the observations, a few of those people will attend to um, watch the umpires and support them as well. We've also have the talent coordinators attending and a few extra additional coaches. So um, we've asked Al and Chelsea if she if they can come along. Um, we've also got Libby Tuvi, who's the female talent coordinator coming along and uh, Greta Miller, who is a female senior VFL boundary umpire. So she'll come along as well. So we've got some female support there for the females attending. Uh, we've got other coaches from all disciplines attending. Uh, from different different levels of experience. So uh, it's set to be a pretty important week for some of these umpires uh, to be observed by potentially their next their next coach. Uh, so we'll we'll see we'll see how everything goes uh, moving forward. What we're also what I'm also working on now is um, the next sort of step after the V-Line Cup, which is the state league contract period. I'm not sure if everyone has heard, but Chris Appleton, who is the AFL goal umpire coach, he's also now been appointed the state league uh, umpire manager, so taken over Michael Jennings' role. So he's only stepped into that role this week. Uh, once he's got his sort of feed, in, feed into the role and he knows and understands his role a lot more, we'll, we'll sit down with him and work out how that process will unfold uh, in October, November this year. So that's a bit of the cycle um, that the Academy is falling or going through at the moment. Uh, and just a little bit of information for the following steps. So uh, like I said, the in-season observations, we're getting the VFL umpires again, the Academy match day coaches to conduct those. V-Line Cup there, uh, so umpires can choose to stay for a week or come for a day. Uh, what batch one have been invited and if you've had any umpires that were invited you hopefully I've sent an email to you to confirm that. Um, if you haven't received an email from me with a list of umpires from your group uh, contact me let me know. Uh, I might have not sent it to everyone. I had I missed one person yesterday so I did have to catch up. Um, state league contracts so at the moment um, We'll just have to wait and see how that works with um, Apple's jumping on board. And the last point, the returning state league umpires. So a little bit, I can give a small update in that space. So VFLW season was meant to have their final starting this week. Uh, obviously it's being pushed back and the VFL uh, is intending to get the final two rounds out of the way when they return in, a, in hopefully a couple of weeks. So. Um, the VFL season, VFLW season will most likely end in mid-July now and not the end of June. So once that's uh, wrapped up, um, anywhere between zero and 10 umpires could be um, told that their contract won't be extended past mid-July, past the VFLW season. Those umpires will be encouraged to contact their former local league or a local league, a uh, community umpiring club that is local to where they're now living. So there's a couple of umpires that have moved to Melbourne over the last uh, 12 months to umpire state league football. So they may wish to umpire where they're now living or they may wish to return back home in, in regional Vic. So in terms of that process, those umpires will be recommended that they return to community football. Um, at this stage, we're not going to ask umpire managers to reach out to them. Um, we're not going to, well, at this stage, we're not going to share any names or how many, um, just because some of those umpires have indicated that they've already umpired 18 to 20 games this year uh, and mentally need a bit of a rest, which is totally fine as well. So um, those umpires will reach out to their local umpire clubs 
uh, when that is all getting set in stone. If you have any questions around that, please reach out to me and I'll pass you on uh, Chris Appleton's details and he's happy to, to speak in more detail on that front. Any questions about the academy process or where we're at with anything? No. Awesome. Uh, community umpire club improvement plan. Just going to push this again. Please uh, fill in your checklists um, on your FootyWeb dashboard. There's a button there. Takes you to the checklist. No need to put in your um, your evidence at this stage. Uh, it's just a checklist to see where you're at. I'm going to hand over to Ando to talk about the coach accreditation. Thanks, Talbo. Um, hi, everyone. Just a couple of minutes on a bit of an update around umpire coach accreditation. I will just share my screen. Uh, if I can do that. See, we'll see how this one goes. Alrighty, I uh, hope you can see that one. Yep. Very, very, very quickly. Um, this, these are the levels of umpire coach accreditation um, for 2021 and moving forward. So uh, again, Tawel will send all this out to you. So I'm going to rush through it pretty quickly. But we've introduced uh, an introductory certification. So we're really keen for those umpires or umpire coaches who just match day coach and who may not um currently want to do the full gamut of umpire coach accreditation um that's a new level very 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 simple there is just a competency checklist that is very 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 short uh and that gets sent through to talbo there will be an online course for this next year but um very 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 easy um development accreditation for new coaches that's there i'll run you through that process in a moment basically new there's uh, the online course, attend an online workshop, and then submit um, checklist competencies. And it, advanced accreditation is very, very similar. There's just some more requirements in terms of you need to submit a coaching plan and a coaching journal. Um, that's a little bit of a, um, a snapshot of the umpire coach course dashboard, but I'll actually jump on and show you on that live in a second. So. Just, just to reiterate, introductory certification for match day, anyone who's doing any match day coaches, so you might have senior umpires who are providing a little bit of feedback, it would be great for them to do this. Um, everything for this year is due by 31st of August, by the way, if you want to capture them in, in this year's um, accreditation for this year. Development accreditation um, timeline, as I said, course, which is live now, I'll show you how to get into that. Basically, you complete the online course, it's about an hour, enrol and attend in a workshop, which is 90 minutes. They're, they're also online. And then, as I mentioned, submit the competency checklist. They're, everything is available in the platform. Uh, advanced uh, timeline, umpire coach timeline. Again, you complete the course, it's a different course, but also takes about an hour. Enrol and attend a workshop. Um, there's some dates there, so they're all being held in July. This is for, for either development or advance. First Mondays in July, first three Mondays in July, seven o'clock. Um, and as I mentioned, the requirements for the advance, for advanced umpire coach accreditation, also need to submit a coaching plan in a journal and the competency checklist. This is two observations where development is only one observation. Um, so in terms of who can tick off, those competencies. Um, basically, an umpire coach at a high level can sign off or tick off the competencies for an umpire coach at a lower level. That's the easiest way to uh, to describe it. So uh, if someone's just doing match day coaching, they want to become an introductory credited umpire coach, a development umpire coach can tick them off. Next level up, you need, if you want to become a development umpire coach, they need to be ticked off by an advanced umpire coach. Um, and as you can see there, we're introducing introduction to high performance uh, umpire coach accreditation. That won't be until next year or 2023. Um, if you're wondering what happened to uh, the leadership 
um, stream, and I think there was another stream. It ex escapes me at the moment. They've been they're being reset, and that they'll kind of wind into the introduction to high performance umpire coach accreditation. They were just Victorian specific um, streams, so th this is where where this is all um, this is all nationalised. Just some other matrices there um, in terms of your if you're an umpire coach, what umpires you can tick off for their accreditation. Um, and if they're an umpire, what what uh, level coach do they need to tick off their accreditation? So I uh, won't won't bore you with that, but they're they're great. They're really good reference documents that you'll need to need to check. Uh, and finally, I uh, just wanted to give everyone a heads up around the umpire training centre. I'll dive into that in just a moment. Um, you go back if you see on the uh, introductory umpire coach certification that. One of the requirements is that you need to be registered in, in um, FootyWeb as an umpire coach. We need to be able to capture them as an umpire coach to be able to accredit them. They're not in there as an umpire coach, we can't accredit them So as an umpire coach. So that just needs to make sure that's flicked over in the background. 30 second video on how to do it there. With any of this stuff and what I'm about to show you, if you have any questions at all, um, the great news is the AFL Customer Service Team can help you with stuff, logins, access, issues having your certificates, uh, whatever the case may be, they they can support. So there's an email address there. It takes about four or five days at the moment for them to get back to you, but there's also a phone number. So when you jump on a line, if you're having any issues at all, feel free to pick up the phone and they can, they can help you out or shoot an email. Now, just before I, I duck off, I will show everyone just how to access this, um, the new platform. And I'll show you the Umpire Training Centre while I'm there. If you haven't already seen it, it's a pretty cool resource. It's most that's been recently updated. So let me take that one off, put this one on, make it a little bigger so you can see it. Uh, this is umpire.afl. So this is obviously our main website, mainly to do with um, recruiting or attracting new umpires. Everyone knows that the EOIs go out to you guys, and I hope you follow them up diligently. But also on this website, uh, so how you access it, courses. Jump in and if you don't already have uh, a profile, create your own, create a, a new profile. So it will look, you ask for details, but you'll end up uh, on this page here. Create your profile, it is free. Log in, uh, I don't want to log out. You will see something that looks like this. So this is where new umpires complete their umpire introductory course. Get here, here, here. If you want to access the umpire coach courses, they're here. So advanced umpire coach course, development umpire coach course. There's some instructions on how to enroll. Again, it's free, it's really, really simple to enroll uh, and that'll flow you through to the details. While I'm here, I just wanted to take the opportunity to show you uh, the umpire training center. So what used to be known as the Umpire Coach Academy, this is now accessible to everyone, to umpires. So uh, this has recently been updated. I don't know how many people on the line have been able to jump on this and have a look. I strongly encourage you to do it. It's basically got all the resources, anything to do with umpire, umpiring, umpire coaching, accreditation, laws of the game, educational videos, anything you could think of, we've put in here. So um, things like, you know, new laws, new laws, coaching vision, it's all in here. Uh, AFL umpires coaching vision, you see there's a whole heap of coaching modules that have been uploaded. Have a look through that. Two, three umpire system, new two umpire system. Everything you could possibly think of is in here. Boundary goal, field, um, coaching resources, and there's um, an umpire managers page that we're slowly adding more things to. Um, as well so i'll leave i'll leave you with that if you haven't logged on and had a look please i encourage you to have a look there's some great resources there and at the moment anyone can jump on create a profile and have a look include you guys or your umpires um that'll be restricted as of next year this is we're changing the way that we um that we act it'll be the same platform we're just changing the way that we access it so I encourage everyone to um get out and, and have a look that's me done. Has anyone got any questions?
take that as take that as a no. I've just blurted out a whole heap of info, but Tabo will send this to you in yeah. in, in slides. I got a quick one, Ando. Uh, just with the intro course for the new umpires, what sort of content is in that? I haven't been able to see. Yeah, it, it's um, a bit. It's a bit, it's a bit umpiring 101. So, um, you know, what's the role of an umpire? Things around, um, you know, basic roles, integrity. It's, it's nothing hugely technical because obviously all, all, I guess all the on the job learning is really, really happens at training and mainly in games. It's really just an over, overarching philosophy around what your role is and what your role is as an umpire. Cool. That's all good. Cool. All, 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 all the all the all the technical stuff you can find in the umpire training centre. Um, next year, just while I've got everyone's attention, next year we will be adding the development umpire coat. Sorry, the development umpire course and the advanced umpire course. So everything will be will be on here. Cool. If you don't have any coach, if you have coaches who aren't yet accredited, jump on. It's really really easy. One hour course. 90 minute workshop, tick them off and their competencies, done. Thanks, Telbo. Thanks, Ando. Um, so move on, a junior club engagement, I've, I've put this up every single month. We've got another couple little examples. Uh, so the first one here, uh, Ando found with AFL Central Vic. Um, so got a umpire one day, play the next. Sharon, to put you on the spot, can I can I get you just to give a little bit of a spiel on how this all sort of started and where it's at? Apparently? Yeah, okay. So um, these boys all play under 16 football and we've been sort of running some stuff out of our under um, 12s group as a sort of learning for field umpires. So these kids all play under, uh, under 16 and they're, they're, they're with a local club. So those three boys are all, uh, one's with Eagle Hawk, two with St. Teresa's. So we're just mentoring them. Last weekend we mentored, um, we had 22 appointments. So 11 mentors and 11 senior umpires because we had no football other than under 12s on the Saturday. So um, yeah, just so that they can, and we've got a sponsor, hence the orange shirts. Um, and it's just, it's a BJFL under 12 um, umpiring group. And they're, those boys play under 16 football and they're umpiring under 12s. They've basically got probably a relation or family member or somebody, or they've been involved with the junior club and they go back and they're helping out. We're paying them $40 a game. So we're, we're actually advertising it as a um, part-time job. And yes, yes. So they, um, yeah, we got a really good response from, and they're loving it. They, we sort of started a new thing with our junior the juniors this year because I, my junior appointments officer left, and we put all the we put all the um, junior games out early in the week and let people come to us with what they're available for, and we're finding that we're filling everything because a lot of people are at games. And they're they're umpiring the game before their kids are playing or the game after, so um, it's actually working really well for us. Sure. Rather than us doing the appointments, they're coming to us and saying, "I'm available to do this." We've got like a, a Google Doc sheet with all the matches, and they can place their names next to what matches they're going to be at, and we're we're filling out all our junior appointments each week, which is great, including yep. under twelves last week. <laughs> Sharon, did you? Did someone take this idea to the clubs to push forward or? Did yeah, well, it's something we've been working with BJFL for the, about the last three years. Um, and and it was a parents, we were using parents and we decided this year to try some of the under 16 kids because we've got kids that don't want a boundary umpire, they want a field umpire. So it's just a, it's a way of starting them off at a higher level, but they're also playing football at a higher level. Like these kids are all in the, you know, the 16 A's. So they're good. They all know their footy pretty well. And they, we had each mentor provide us with a report last week. And um, they all come back that they, you know, apart from some positioning and stuff, most of them and a few signals, most of them knew their footy, did really well. We'll um, run probably not as many this week now that we've got footy here, but we haven't got all footy. We've just got some. We'll run... Um, maybe another eight kids this week. 
It's just a trial thing. We're seeing if it works. How many how many umpires have you got in total? In this program, I've got 11. Yeah. But I can't run them all every week because I haven't got mentors for them all every week. So in this instance, Gary ran with one of the kids and then he ran with the other two over two games. But the part of the thing is we're, we're trying to, once they've done sort of two or three weeks of mentoring, we want to run them together with the same person the same kid each year so they get used to each other and they can help each other out so they'll always run in twos and they can be friends or they can be from the same club but um yeah rather than um appointing them with someone they don't know it's about running with a mate and they go and do it together yeah sounds good sharon i think we, yeah. we might uh get an update probably in, in august to see how yeah. they're from here yeah. to, to then yeah. so well We've got an interleague carnival in three weeks um, at the under 12 level and I can't supply umpires because it's a Saturday afternoon. So these kids will go in and umpire that interleague carnival for the under 12s and they'll, it's three weeks away. So we're full on trying to get some mentoring into them now so that they feel confident enough to um, to be able to do it. Excellent. Thanks yep. very much, Aaron. That's all right. Um, and the other little screenshot I've got there is uh, it's just a screenshot out of a study that was done by um, someone external to AFL Vic. So um, there was a um, a youth um, survey done with uh, young people who are involved in football clubs in regional Victoria. Um, and this is just a screenshot from the results summary. And the first point that was made to the AFL Vic team was that a lot of young people uh, actually searching for opportunities to do coaching or umpiring within their football club. So uh, just to highlight this junior club engagement program idea, it's it's something that um, if it's put forward to a, a football club or a league, people will or young young players will actually step up and and take the opportunity and see it as a leadership a leadership step within their own club. So um, for those who are still sort of teetering on the the uh, uh, where, you know whether how do I do it? Whether I do it, um, just more support from football clubs and and young people, young players in general, that they're actually looking for these opportunities. Uh, and again, just the, those four steps, which are sent around uh, in previous workshops. But those four steps again. So if anyone wants any any assistance with any of this, please reach out. Uh, last item before we finish up, so the Victorian umpire requirements. So um, I sent everyone an email with that uh, onerous spreadsheet with a lot of data in it. Uh, I'm not going to go into specifics to each uh, league or umpire club because um, every umpire club and every league is is very different in their makeup and and what's required. But I'm just going to give a bit of a, a bit of an overall snapshot across Victoria. There are a few things to remember when taking in this 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 data. So it's not absolute data and it's not not always going to be 100 percent accurate in terms of what you're actually appointing games to. So I've applied a few rules that I've just applied across the entire state to try and make it fair rather than trying to apply specific rules to certain leagues, or umpire groups that are different um, you know, to everyone. So Basically, the rules that I, I followed was that for every senior reserve and um, an under 19s or an 18s competition that's on a Saturday, I included the, the appointments of field boundary and goal. So two field, two boundary, two goal. I know that there's some leagues and, and clubs that actually supply three field or three boundary, but I've just applied two. If there was any thirds or fourths competitions, I've applied just field umpires except for in VAFA, uh, where they have seven divisions of seniors and reserves, um, and then thirds and fourths. So thirds and fourths was not applied for the VAFA group. And I know VAFA is, they operate very, very differently again. Um, field boundary and goal were applied to the oldest junior age group, uh, so age competitions, um, except when those uh, junior competitions were played on the same day. So there's some leagues where they'll actually have 12s, 14s, 16s, 18s, reserves, seniors in the same day. So in that case, you know, the 12s, 14s, 16s don't get field boundary and goal, they only get the field. Um, but if there's junior competitions run on Sunday, so the oldest age group on that day, so 
most of the time it's under 17s or under 16s. They would receive field boundary and goal umpires for each of those games. And I only applied field umpires to age groups that are under 10 and above unless I already knew of a modified rule competition for an age group. So uh, there was a couple of leagues where they have under 10s and under 12s where it's modified rules. Uh, I didn't apply any league appointed umpires for those competitions. Now with these four steps, I've applied the exact same criteria to any female competitions. So with regards to whether they're senior reserve, 19s, under 12s, uh, female comps receive the same the same uh, umpiring uh, panels. What I have done though is um, to to work out uh, required female umpires. The female competitions have required female umpires. So for a senior female uh, game, two senior fem two field two female field umpires, two female boundary umpires, two female goal umpires. What I've also done is for all appointments uh, included an extra 20%. So um, Ando uh, said that he did a, just a little bit of research. It's not an official official research, but he said he looked at a couple of different competitions a few years ago in unavailability and umpiring and found that um, a couple of competitions, regardless of what state they were in, there was approximately 20% of umpires that were unavailable from week to week. So I've included an extra 20% of umpires for all appointments across um, each competition. Uh, moving across the right, the female ratio. So the female ratio is how many females to males there are. So I've done that for, player, for players and for umpires. And then the gap is how many females are required for the female umpires ratio to meet the same ratio in playing. So if we go straight down to um, the pink section down the bottom, so all female umpires at this stage, that's one in 10, so one female per 10 umpires. When we compare that to players at this stage, it's one female for every six players. So umpires, it's one female, nine, nine male, and in players, it's one female and five male players. <clears throat> and to, <clears throat> sorry, to, meet the same ratio of umpires to players, we need a further 489 female umpires. And then that same split's been done underneath for Metro and Country. Now, moving to the left of the screen, so the total amount of matches in this column here, 1,796, that is the most amount of matches that can happen on a particular day. So it's not the amount of matches that happen across the entire weekend. It is just the most amount of matches that can happen in one day. Some competitions will have more matches on a Sunday. Some competitions will have more matches on a Saturday. And then the that same uh, rationale has been applied with the required umpires in total and the required female umpires um, in these two columns here. And then we've got the break the registered umpires number. So all this data was correct as of the 31st of May, so it might have changed slightly. Uh, so a week and a half ago, this what this data was all set on. Um, now, just to try and highlight a few few uh, disparities here. So there's that number of matches, 1,796 on a particular day in Victoria. There is a requirement on that day when we need that many matches, there is a requirement of 8,304 appointments, 3,960 field umpires, 2,301 boundary, 2,042 goal umpires. Uh, in terms of female competitions, we need 1,484 Female umpires in total, 790 which need to be field, 377 boundary, and 318 goal umpires. But in reality, what we've got is uh, these figures here. So we're short in total about 1,286. We're short 315 field umpires, 393 boundary, 1,116 goal umpires. And in terms of female numbers, we're short more than double the female umpires that we currently have. Uh, and that's again highlighted with female field umpires. Uh, there's only 
we're only missing 128 female boundary umpires, so it's quite close yeah, to what female boundaries are required, and we're missing more than half goal umpires again. Now, this is also taking into account that each umpire only has one appointment in a weekend or on that day. So we know that does that's not what that's what that's not what happens, but this is just assuming that an umpire only umpires once on that day. And just the last slide to finish off. Um, so that female ratio when we compared the players. So currently there's 25,294 female players and we have 1,484 female umpires. So players we have one female per six players, so five of them are male and when it comes to umpires, we've got that one female out of every 10 players, nine of them are boys. And we break it down into discipline, which, and this is something that uh, I actually thought wouldn't be the case, but um, we have one female field umpire per 12 um, field umpires. So there's 11 male field umpires to one female. We have one female boundary to seven uh, boundary umpires. So six of them are male boundary umpires. And we have one goal umpire, one female goalie to eight goal umpires in total. So seven of those are male umpire, goal umpires. And to, to meet this same player ratio, we need another 362 female field, 79 female boundary and 47 female goal. Um, so with this data, and this is not something that I'm going to ask for solutions right away um, but the big question is how can we start to change these sorts of numbers in 2022 um, now if, if there's anyone who wants to ask any questions or, or give their thoughts on some of this data right away i'm more than happy to hear it um, but this is something that we'll um, address again later in the year uh, we're hoping uh, like we were planning last year to have a bit of a uh, face-to-face a -face catch up for all umpire managers and directors across the state in sort of October, November. We're hoping to do that again and that's where we'll hopefully address this question more broadly. Um, does anyone have any thoughts, queries or concerns with any of the data that I've sent through um, more broadly? Um, if people want to speak about their own specific umpire clubs, I'm more than happy to have that chat offline, but has anyone got any queries um, off the top of their heads. Right. Is anyone anyone surprised about the data, especially uh, the female ratios here? So I would have thought that female field umpires would actually be higher. <clears throat> higher up and we'd have more female fieldies. Is that, does that surprise anyone that is probably more female boundaries compared to males across their groups? Anything that doesn't quite add up? Andrew, we struggle, we struggle to we hold on to them. Like we, we sometimes we get a really big bunch of female and then they don't come back the next year. Um, and we sort of questioned a few of them this year and, you know, there was, they'd had a year off. There was, they had boyfriends now, they had um, year 12, they've got part-time jobs and they couldn't fit umpiring in. And so we're the, probably the lowest we've been in female umpires for years at the moment. Um, and it's not through one of promotion. We, we might get one or two girls come down and then because there's no other girls there, they say to me, oh, there's no girls here. So they then don't feel comfortable to come back. So it's, you're fighting against the whole time that you you might get a couple, but they don't stay because there's no other girls there for them to hang around with or be part of. Yep. So that's making it hard for us. Yeah, uh, that, that whole uh, there's no other girls here is something that um, and I myself have chatted about potentially looking at doing something a little bit different. Um, yeah. You know wh whether it will work or not, we don't know. But it's yeah that that whole support network we're finding is is where it can break down break down a lot. That that support from other females is really important. Yeah. So if you don't have that that core group, makes it really hard to to get 
more to sort of join into that group as well. That's exactly. And I had one girl this year that was would have done really well, but she said, "Oh, there's just no girls here, and I don't want to stay." And so you know, you and you can't argue the point because it's true. Great, great, great call out, Sharon. We were just waiting. Uh, I don't know if you if you're aware, but um, the AFL partner with Sydney Uni. We're just waiting for girls and women uh, in Australian football umpiring report to drop. Um, yeah. Uh, all the recommendations, the findings are out. Waiting, waiting for the recommendations uh, to drop. That that'll be presented to the AVL. So we're hope, hoping to get um, some really clear guidance on what what we need to do um, as a community, but also uh, attach to that. Hopefully, will be some funding so we can do some really cool, some really cool initiatives. So um, we'll, we'll put you. We'll put you guys right at the top of the list to be able to to be able to do that, and that's it resonates. Uh, it, it talks exactly to that. So um, stay tuned. Great, great. I don't I don't think the uh, figures are surprising at all, and I think anecdotally they'll be similar to previous years. I've always felt there's more boundaries and goals in female than in field umpiring, um, based on the experiences and the places I've been. Uh, but in fairness to this year's data the main focus i think for everybody was just to get people back umpiring to get back in the game and it wasn't specifically aimed at at any gender in particular it was about re-engaging the people who had previously been there to get them back umpiring so i don't think the figures would be any different um although maybe a couple of percentage points either way but um you know, we did lose quite a few female umpires uh, to playing football, and that hasn't transitioned back um, at all over the last two or three years from what I can see. So, yeah, I just think that the figures this year are based more on getting people back um, rather than absolute targeting particular areas. Yeah, it's a fair point, Jock, and, and I do want to stipulate that these, these figures aren't there to, I guess, highlight the lack of work or or issues that people are having. It's just, I guess, we're, we've had a year off and this is a task that I've been able to actually sink my teeth into. And now we've got a bit of a baseline after uh, a horrible 2020. So it's, um, yeah, as you as you point out, it's not it's not reflective of targeting or anything like that. It's, it's reflective of having a year off and now we've got a new baseline that we can start to work towards to improve in certain areas. Guess probably is what we're trying to, trying to highlight is, in a perfect world, whether everyone agrees or not, but female footy would be great if it was, you know, be, being able to be self-sustained by female umpires. And we know that doesn't have to be the case and people can bump around between genders, absolutely. But the easiest way to break it down is to say, well, we're never going to have enough umpires unless we start trying to, um, yeah, unless we try and get more female umpires. We're always going to be behind the eight ball. With female footy growing, um, Unless we can get more females in umpiring, and we, and we don't, we don't have the answers to that. Um, we, we're never going to have enough numbers. That, that's probably what we're trying to say in a nutshell. So how can we, how, how can we think um, a bit differently in future years? How we, how we get more women and girls uh, involved in umpiring, just to, to to close the gap. Otherwise, we never will. Yeah, I agree fully. I think the um, one of the questions I got asked to me earlier in the year was, why, why doesn't the AFL women's competition promote umpiring more? Um, you know, if they want to push for a female um, umpiring base at that level, um, then we've got to get it at community level. So why why aren't the Nicole Livingstons, why aren't the, the major AFLW players promoting umpiring um, as, as part of their jobs as well? Um, now, whether they're doing it or not, the person that asked me the question simply wasn't seeing it. So maybe there's a, there's a gap there. Ex excellent call out, Jock. Excellent call out. Just to jump in there, everyone, from a coaching point of view, we're having exactly the same conversations what you are around um, female coaches as well. If we don't get more female coaches into the game, the same. We're going to be behind the eight ball of how many coaches we can provide for these teams as well. So we're having very similar conversations as you all are. Just a 
quick point on that. Um, I know the NTFL do really well with their female participation. I think in some years they've had like 30% of members um, female, which I think would be probably a lot higher than anywhere else. Um, would be interesting to see what they do differently there, um, or if the demographics are just different, because um, yeah, they've been pretty successful with it. Yeah, th thanks Billy, sorry, just writing down. We I mean, definitely reach out to them to to find out what what they do and you know see if there is anything different and, and we can share that with everyone to I guess see how how it can be implemented in Vic. Any other final thoughts or queries concerns? So again it's not it's not a fix it fix it right this second sort of thing it's um, we've now got some some data that we can start work towards and it's not saying that females are the only missing link you know we're still still short you know for, to try and help help uh, spread the load we're still short both males and female empires so it's not specifically just females but the, there's definitely uh, some case to, to try and improve that space uh, and before we log off now uh, are there just any other Questions, concerns, anything else anyone wants to bring up while we're while we're together? No, I think I think we're all good. Well, uh, on that note, um, thanks again for taking some time out. Uh, hopefully, um, you've been able to, I know it's not ideal, but we've been able to use the lockdown to uh, just take take a bit of a breather from this year. It would have been a lot different. Um, lots of things have, have changed and how we do things are a little bit different. So um, hopefully it's a little bit timely in that you've able to just take a, take a breather, restock, and uh, hopefully we are all returning back to the field uh, in the coming weekends if you haven't already, especially in regional areas. Um, again, if there's anything else that anyone, uh, any queries or anything you've got, please reach out to myself and our other team. We're always here to help and uh, we will all chat again in a month's time. Thanks very much.